Shall we start? Okay, I suppose that everybody who was supposed to be here is here with us. If it's so, it's already a great achievement for our dying group because so many friends, some of them friends of mine for years and years, some others that we have acquired during our work, the only fact that they are here is an evidence of the usefulness, I would say, of our group. And I am proud that the group has my name, even though dying today is not among my first choices, but it's the group dying with my name, not me. Let me say that when we created this group, when the Center for European Reform created this group, really it was a sort of club for experts of very specialized issues, the issues of the freedom and security area that was not very popular among the items of the European Community First and Union later on. But throughout the years, we realized that the, our discussions were not technical and sectoral discussions on very specialized matters. There is quite an amount of specializations in these things, but these things little by little became crucial for the life of the Europeans and for the life of the Union itself. Think of migration. Think of the pandemic recently and of the Schengen area of freedom of movement, of the relationship among the member states and think of the rule of law, the uh, controversial nature of so many issues that we are still now dealing with in uh, relation to something that rule, rule of law, that is an essential part of the so-called third pillar, the initially almost unknown third pillar we were dealing with. So uh, now the heritage that we leave, let's say, for the future might have an impact. Let me say, might have an impact mostly if the proposal that Camino has been working on and has written in the paper that you will be discussing in a few minutes will be taken seriously by the union and its institutions because a semester devoted to these matters means devoting to these matters the same attention that is given to the budgetary matters. And these things are no less important than the budgetary matters. Now every European citizen is aware of, uh, of this and it would also be an excellent platform upon which the union could build a strengthened role for the commission and also more cooperation among the member states. But this is already part of your discussion. I don't want to enter into it in these initial words that are going to finish how. They're going to finish, as far as I'm concerned, by thanking, warmly thanking, the institutions that have been the underpinnings of, of the group, the center and the open society, the ladies, because this has been an adventure, most of all, of four ladies, uh, Camino, Heda, Julia, and then uh, Annalisa, Alessia, who is working less for me now because uh, uh, from working like this uh, does not require logistic uh, activity very much. 
And uh, my best wishes to all of the participants, the old and new friends. And I think that after all, it's, um, it's very simple, but I'm confident that our union will have a better future. F sorry for the British friends who decided to leave, but you know, sometimes there are mistakes and this has been a huge mistake, but the remedy is still possible in the future. Thank you all. Thanks, Juliano. Um, sorry, I'm just going to jump in because I realized that I um, ask you and um, Liz in this case to actually give a, a sort of a keynote um, speech without realizing that this was a webinar. So there is no such a thing as a you know podium or whatever. Um, and then I um, I ask Heather to chair uh, the actual discussion. So uh, there is no chair for the keynote speech. Um, which means that I will be myself introducing, thanking you very much, Juliano, for your really kind words and for steering the group, but that's something that I will say afterwards. And I will, I will kindly ask Liz um, to, 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 to say, uh, to step in, she's stepping in for Antonio today, and she will explain why, and she has kindly agreed, and thank you very much, Liz, I know that um, this is not an ideal situation for any of us these days, uh, but she has kindly uh, agreed to step in to say some words um, to um, get us um, started in this discussion. Thank you, uh, Camino, and um, my apologies on behalf of uh, Antonio Vitorino, who very much wanted to join this afternoon, but when you get a call from the Secretary General, he's the one authority within the UN system uh, that Antonio can't say no to. So I'm afraid he's had to join a meeting of the principals of UN agencies and is unable to be here today. Um, luckily, however, as his special advisor, I have also been a member of the Amato Group for the full seven years since its beginning. So I feel at least semi-qualified to uh, speak to this quite incredible project. Um, and one that makes me feel old when I think back seven years ago. Um, myself, Antonio and Eugenio Ambrosi, a third member of the Amato Group, all moved to Geneva about halfway through this project and transition from the EU to the UN to experience a different kind of bureaucracy, though many of the same issues. And uh, discussing this beforehand, we all agreed that Geneva is not as much fun as Brussels and particularly for these kinds of discussions that the Amato group held. That, that, kind of, that ability to come together and have an intellectual discussion about the direction of travel is something that's severely lacking here and that we all miss. Um, that opportunity for learning, and myself as someone who focuses on migration and is much less familiar with the other parts of the Justice and Home Affairs portfolio, it was fascinating to learn about different parts of the system with which I'm much less familiar, but where you see many of the same trends and many of the same challenges which the Amato Group was able to draw out. Um, I won't comment on the fact that, that EU policy in the area of migration and justice and home affairs has stagnated in the past three years and, and whether that might have something to do with some key members moving to Geneva. I'm sure not, but Antonio may have different views. Um, but I just wanted to make a couple of observations that may help kick off the, the discussion with the caveat that I am not so engaged in these discussions as I was uh, a few years ago, but they remain fascinating on, on many levels. And, the broad premise of the paper, which is that we don't necessarily need technocratic solutions, we need an effort to rebuild trust between member states, I think is a critical observation and one that will be absolutely key over the next years. Um, and that central premise, I think, in, and that diagnosis is extremely important. I want to add a, a couple of other observations that might be interesting or um, helpful, which is from where I sit, it seems that staying still and staying silent is effectively moving backwards. And we see that particularly with the situation at the Belarus-Polish border. We see that 
it various areas across the EU where pushbacks are becoming much more the norm than they might have been seven years ago when the Amato Group started. And the acceptance of certain aspects of uh, justice and home affairs, immigration and asylum policy that were seen as core tenets that are now being loosened. And they're being loosened perhaps in the hope that silence will improve trust, whereas silence just seems to loosen those foundations upon which much of this system is built. And so I think we need to not pander to mistrust by giving into it, but rather seek ways to rebuild it that allow you to base, to, to, to strengthen those principles. And I think again, and this is what the paper alludes to, which is doing the same thing over and over again, retabling the same proposals effectively, moving ahead again and again to the same negotiations, knowing what the outcome will be in the same deadlocks and the same politics in the hope of change is not necessarily the way forward. But I think that goes for a lot of different aspects particularly of immigration and asylum policy, funding the same programming, assuming the same, uh, that, that, that taking the same policy choices again and again will suddenly result in different outcomes is perhaps reach the end of the road and some, some sy systemic change in the way we approach some of these issues needs to be addressed. And a final observation sat here in what is the remote wilds of Geneva, Three years ago when we moved here um, and a global compact on migration had been negotiated and was about to be adopted in Morocco in December 2018. It was extremely politically fraught at that moment and not all EU members signed up to the global compact and famously neither did the United States. It was tense, it felt very polarized and many of the tensions we see at the EU level were playing out at the global level. Three years on, what we see is something of a second honeymoon for the global compact on migration. The US has softened its position significantly. Many of the other states have become much quieter in their objections and are, are looking for ways to join the first review forum of the global compact, which will take place in May of this year. And we see lots of the discussions developing in an interesting way on key issues from climate to my, climate and the impacts on mobility through to loss of life in vulnerable places such as the Mediterranean. And here I think there's a question about how the global conversation has managed to find a way of moving on and the European conversation seems to have found it itself being stuck. So these ideas of big compacts or big semesters where they may not have those immediate results or those immediate indicators and impacts that we look for do actually give you an opportunity to engage in a different kind of dialogue. And that may be extremely valuable. Um, and one of my major concerns is that the EU is becoming much more introverted in dealing with its problems rather than seeing itself as a global leader. And just to give you a final example, which I think is the management of borders during the COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated this, where the EU is extremely effective in finding ways of working together to manage cross-border mobility within the EU that gave little thought to how they were going to then manage that with third countries outside the EU. And we now see that disaggregation on a global scale, risking a two tier immigration system emerging with those countries that do have the facilities, the vaccination rates and the financing to be able to facilitate mobility and those countries that lack all of those things. And so there is, a, I think also as the global discussion starts to accelerate, an opportunity to rethink some of these European issues within that global context and think about what kind of leadership role and voice the European Union wants in the future. If you don't mind, I will leave it there um, with my apologies again for Antonio's absence and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Liz. We really appreciate your joining us. And in particular, giving uh, the more of the international view, um, you're such an expert on EU matters, uh, having worked for uh, migration, our migration policy at EU level here in Brussels for so long, um, but also now working um, with Antonio Vitorino in the UN, it's very good to remind us um, that the world has not stopped still, um, even while Europe has been um, uh, thinking about um, its own internal matters. So very helpful and also for giving us the, um, 
the range of issues uh, that really are on the table. Um, it's a great pleasure to have here today with us so many uh, former as well as current officials working on the vast range of justice and home affairs area of freedom, security and justice um, matters. Um, some I see uh, are retired, others are still in office. Uh, we even have two former permanent representatives of the, of the United Kingdom to the European Union, just to give a sense of, of history that's just represented in this group. Um, and I just wanted to remind everybody before we go into Camino's fascinating paper, of the history of this area of work in the EU, which as the, the third pillar, as it was called long ago when it started, as Giuliano Amato reminded us, was really see, very, very technical and not very political. Um, and as Liz has just reminded us, it has risen, the, the matters covered under what used to be the third pillar have risen to the very top of the political agenda. And that's partly why I think so much trust has been lost, uh, that matters that were dealt with um, through technical meetings and all kinds of um, working groups within the council uh, of civil servants who were not used to talking to the public, who never really needed to um, explain their work to a broader audience, um, that's really completely changed. Um, and in the time since the Amato Group was created, um, the politicization of many of these issues um, and the political salience of them has, has only grown. That's not necessarily a good thing, as Liz was just pointing out. Um, more politics doesn't necessarily mean better practice um, in handling things like border control. Um, and particularly, we always see in the run up to elections, uh, politicians suddenly having a much greater focus on the control part of border management, uh, when actually there are also many other issues at stake. Um, just so that those who weren't present at the creation of the area of freedom, security and justice can appreciate the uh, distinguished history of the Centre for European Reform as a think tank working on this area. I remember um, a, an early meeting with Antonio Vitorino when he had just become the very first commissioner for what was then called Justice and Home Affairs, which the CER hosted in Brussels. I think this was in 2000. And um, Antonio Vitorino talked about the petit pas of European integration and the need to take little steps. And he said, I'm very good at that because I only take little steps. And he pointed to his, to his shoes. Um, a very typically uh, Antonio Vitorino um, remark. Um, and he, I remember at that meeting said um, that uh, much of the work needs to remain technical because that's how you get things done at EU level. Um, and that's a way that, and it's really vital, he said, that officials learn to trust one another uh, because they are used to working inside the interior ministries um, and, and other justice ministries um, and not really talking to foreigners, unlike diplomats who work in other areas of EU policy. And that's something that needed to change. And many of the participants in this meeting today have done that throughout their careers. They have internationalized many of the justice and home affairs issues. And just to bookend um, CER history on this, one of the last meetings, I think, that uh, Sir Julian King, who was the last British commissioner held, um, and of course he was then responsible for this area, um, was also with the Centre for European Reform. Um, and uh, Julian has also always stressed this issue of trust and how difficult and precarious it is uh, to build that between the member states. And something that Giuliano Amato has, has long stressed uh, also in his work on constitutional law as an academic is that trust is something that is built through fit. It's built through um, activities, and daily workings uh, between officials and between systems. And we've now seen some pretty severe breakdowns um, of that trust with, for example, one member state refusing to send, and this is only one instance, but a member state openly refusing to send um, a suspect, or in fact, a, um, uh, a person for trial in another member state saying that the independence of the judiciary um, could not be guaranteed in that member state and therefore a fair trial uh, was, not was, was not guaranteed to be possible. Uh, this is a very far cry from um, the system of trust that was supposed to be built through uh, the activities on, uh, on justice and home affairs. And of course, in that time, there's also been a huge growth in the whole agenda 
of the area of freedom, security and justice. Um, there's the internal security agenda, which of course Sir Julian King himself did so much to build up as commissioner. There's also the migration crisis of 2015 to 2016, which is, as Liz was just saying, has not necessarily led to um, more um, permanently coordinated policies. Uh, we still see fragmented policies. And the idea of reforming the Schengen area uh, remains um, a hot political topic. It's, it's every few years, it's a call to reform the Schengen area. And Emmanuel Macron has, has just added to those that number of calls um, uh, as he began the French presidency of the European Union um, at the beginning of this year. So JHA remains um, a very complex area, but it's ever more political. And the Centre for European Reform was one of the first think tanks that really started looking across the whole range of JHA, AFSJ policies. And that tradition continues with the paper that uh, is launched today that uh, Camino Montero Martinez will introduce in a moment, which really highlights the interconnections between the policy areas. She presents the spillovers between the many crisis responses that have come up um, have been very much necessary for the EU to engage in from the migration crisis to the rule of law crisis um, and points out that uh, those spillovers are often just simply not taken into account by ministers and indeed prime ministers and presidents who are meeting late at night and looking for a short term solution that they can present to the journalists waiting outside immediately. And most importantly of all, in this paper, she also looks at the implications for the whole European project. Um, of the breakdown of trust between member states. There are major implications, not only for um, things like the common arrest warrant um, and um, mutual recognition of court decisions, but also for the entire common legal space, the entire community of law that underpins the single market. And this is something that is not taken as seriously as it should. Um, and I think we should expect a robust debate today about how far this can uh, be remedied and whether the idea, the idea of big semesters um, is the right way to go about it. Um, and the lack of an acquis communautaire in this area remains. There is still so much left to interpretation by the member states. There's still a lack of common definitions of key standards, uh, for example, on rule of law and independence of the judiciary, because it's been so difficult to get member states to agree on such things that often it's been easier for presidencies and even presidents of the European Council simply to move on from one crisis to the next. So Camino, we're really very interested in hearing what you have to say. Thank you so much for joining us today after a horrendous week of COVID and isolation with family. Um, there's been uh, not only his Camino been struck down, but also my colleague Julia Lagana, um, who is um, who works very closely with Camino on this and, and has also been isolating with small children and having COVID. So it's pretty rough uh, time, but um, I'm really glad that your brains are still working in tip top condition um, and looking forward to what you have uh, to say, Camino. And for all of those who haven't yet seen the paper, um, there is actually a link in the chat um, and you can see it on the CER website. Don't read it now, listen to what Camino has to say, uh, but it's very clearly written and it will it spells out a lot of the important and technical details uh, that we will uh, we'd like to discuss today and which I hope will also become part of the debate under the French presidency and beyond. Over to you, Camino. Um, thanks. <clears throat> thanks so much, Heather, and, and also Giuliano and obviously Liz as well for your kind words. And um, I think you've been too kind uh, since my brain is absolutely not working um, as it should. And that's, uh, you can hear it um, also in my very thick uh, Spanish accent at the moment since I'm stranded in Spain um, with my family thanks to COVID um, and able to return to Brussels. Um, so you can blame COVID on uh, the number of outlandish um, uh, claims that I'm going to make during this presentation. Uh, like, for example, I'm here to explain to you how to magically solve the European Union's migration, security and rule of law problems. Although I think that's actually what this paper is trying to do. Um, so it perhaps is not as outlandish as my COVID brain um, has me thinking. So the paper we're launching today is the results of the results, sorry, of many, many years of work. I did get a few white hairs trying to untangle the ins and outs of the European Union's justice and home affairs policies and trying to come up with original and relevant proposals at a time when migration, security and more recently the rule of law uh, were making headlines and are still making headlines 
um, worldwide. Today, I can say that those white hairs were worth it, I think. Um, I cannot claim, of course, to have an answer to all of the European Union's problems, um, because after all, I'm not a politician trying to run for office. Uh, but I do believe that the work we've done over the past seven years has helped explaining the complexity of these issues to both policymakers and the wider public, and perhaps most importantly, has helped explaining why it is so important to be realistic while dealing with them. I'm a lawyer by background, so I'm programmed to favor regulation and court rulings as good solutions to problems. I also do still believe that the European Union is a good thing, so that should make me even more inclined to think that European Union laws and the ECJ can and should step in when policies like migration policies or the rule of law, whatever, run into trouble. And yet this paper advocates for none of that. The European Union's area of freedom, security and justice may be a legal construction, but its problems, as we said before, are political. And as such, they require a political solution and that should be one that can be backed by voters, whether we agree with their politics of choices of choice or not, because that's what a democracy does. I'll get to that political solution um, soon, but first, let me explain you why I think the European Union has been wrong in the way it deals with the problems facing its area of freedom, security and justice. And for that, I will briefly outline what these problems are, and where they come from, and I'll finish my intervention by suggesting a plan to fix them, inspired by the oddest of events, the Eurozone and financial crisis and the COVID-19 pandemic. And I haven't gone, uh, gone mad. I will explain you why I think um, these events could be useful for the area of freedom, security and justice in a minute. Um, so we know that the area of freedom, security and justice has gone through a series of shocks over the past seven years, whether this relate to migration, asylum policies, security concerns, or the rule of law. At the same time, there have been very limited efforts to fix the area's shortcomings at once. And as Heather was saying before, both EU governments and the EU institutions have chosen to follow a piecemeal strategy, uh, treating each problem as an isolated accident, uh, which made sense until now, uh, because it is always an easier sell to voters when you separate migration issues from, say, the rule of law. But I do not think this is a sustainable strategy anymore. There is a reason why all these crises seem to be happening at the same time, or at least in very close succession, and it's because they're all connected. As um, Heather said before, I think it's naive to think that migration flows will not affect the way the Europeans think about security, and it's wrong to believe that migration, border, and security issues will not spill over into other parts of EU policy making, such as the recovery fund or the rule of law. The only reason, and I think that's something that we don't say enough, why the European Union has an area of freedom, security, and justice in the first place is because of Schengen. Now, to date, Schengen has been quite resilient, has managed to weather a migration crisis, several terrorist attacks, and a pandemic because of two things. Because having no borders involves the sharing of both benefits and burdens, and it presupposes a high degree of mutual trust between its members. But that trust has uh, been diminishing very quickly in recent years. And I think both the EU institutions and EU governments have ignored or forgotten, if we are being kind, the compromises that are required to make Schengen work. So all these issues, which, as we said before, were once the preserve of a handful of nerdy lawyers and academics and policy makers, um, have become a, a massive political problem. Migration security, and that includes health security at the moment, and European Union values are possibly amongst the most contentious issues of European Union policies, and they can win or lose elections at home. 
To me, most importantly, collectively, they have created new rifts within the European Union or and aggravated pre-existing fault lines. Uh, for example, the European Union and the member states uh, used to tolerate Orban's antics until the 2015-2016 migration crisis exposed a new and very important division between Eastern and Western European member states. Interestingly, that crisis also mirrored the divisions that became apparent during the Eurozone crisis between 2010 and 2012. And now the role over the rule of law has intensified these splits, the split between the original EU 15 and countries which joined the European Union after um, 2004, sorry. Security is less divisive at the moment, but it has become entangled in broader discussions over the European Union's borders and Europe's values, and also questions over the, pla the place of religion in Europe. And for that, you, also, you only have to look at uh, the portfolio of uh, the European Union Commissioner in charge of protecting or promoting, sorry, uh, the European way of life, which includes um, security and months and a trope of other things. Now, all this crisis, in my view, and that's not necessarily a view that everybody that everybody shares, sorry, uh, but to me, all these crises have been, some say to some degree, but I actually think all these crises have been the result of diminishing trust between member states. In turn, each of those crises has fed suspicions and made countries more wary of each other. And to me, and that again, it's possibly a very um, sort of like, nerdy position because I work uh, on these topics all the time, but waning trust is, in my view, uh, the European Union's most pressing problem because there is no part of the project, certainly not the area of freedom, security and justice, but neither the single market or the eurozone or, you know, whatever cooperation on anything, you name it, that can work without trust. And this might sound like a very dramatic grandstanding uh, of the kinds um, my um, Spanish dramatic self would make, but let me give you some concrete examples. I think the most important consequence of a gradual loss of trust is that eventually it can lead to the exclusion of EU countries from the union's common legal space. This is actually already happening de facto, as Heather was mentioning, uh, for example, countries are refusing to extradite um, wanted criminals or wanted people, uh, but also when countries do not um, do not return uh, asylum seekers uh, to other countries because of dire asylum reception. So this is happening de facto. Um, it can actually get worse if um, you know we we get into a point where we question um, a country system so much so uh, that we decide to effectively suspend the application of parts of the EU acquis, acquis uh, to this country. And this is something that has been in the courts and uh, discussed uh, very widely about um, Poland and Hungary in recent years. Now, I think, um, you know, if we want to make this, like if we want to make people understand how urgent and how important this question is, um, we probably need to like talk about how this common legal space is not only about police and judicial cooperation, but it's also about the single markets and it's also about people's life. Because goods, people, and to an extent, services and capital move freely in the European Union because citizens and companies alike rely on European Union wide standards, including court's rulings. So if we have a country which system other countries do not trust, or if a judiciary gets captured in a member state, both civil and criminal law cooperation will become more difficult, then business will be wary of setting up shop, and then people's personal decisions, like buying a house, having a kid, changing a job, will be affected too, and that would have a huge effect, in my view, on public support for the European Union, which is a thing that, you know, it's important to think about when we're thinking about the future of the European Union. Now, I don't think the European Union will solve its trust problem by laws or court rulings alone, because as I said before, this is a problem um, that stems from political rather than legal differences. If we want to rebuild trust, I think we need to be prepared uh, to have a higher level of accountability over how countries uh, apply 
policies related to the area of freedom, security, and justice. And that includes migration, that includes civil law, that includes criminal law, that includes uh, security, uh, intelligence cooperation, um, and so on. I don't think that countries, um, you know, governments are actually like being like not necessarily like being very aware of the trade-offs and, and the importance of linking all these things together is because of bad faith, some maybe. But I think there is more simply a general lack of understanding um, amongst member states, but also amongst uh, the institutions sometimes of what the union's area of freedom, security and justice actually is. And, and there is an incredible lack of ambition to make it clear. And that I think is where the problem um, is, comes from. So if we want to, to rebuild trust, I think the European Union should be really bold and should ac accept that we need to rethink the way the area of freedom, security and justice works and clarify the compromises it involves. And that's not going to be easy. And that's where I think um, the, the financial and the Eurozone crisis and the pandemic coming. And that is really strange, I know. Why do I think this? I think there are clear parallels between Schengen and its accompanying area of freedom, security and justice and the Eurozone. Both are very ambitious projects uh, in the absence of an overarching federal state. Both are some of people's favorite things about the European Union, you know, like traveling around with no borders, the single currency, all that. And both have proved to be unprepared to absorb shocks. Uh, we call it, call it a global economic crisis, a pandemic or a sudden surge in migration flows, and um, are plagued by repeated failures from member states to abide by the rules. And that can be on deficit and debt limits, border controls, or judicial independence. But when the euro crisis sort of like instilled a sense of doom in Europe's political elites because they thought, oh my God, you know, this common currency might actually um, collapse uh, if we don't do something about it. Um, I don't think this sense of urgency has so far uh, materialized when it comes to the European Union's area of freedom, security and justice. So I think, and that's what this paper is calling for, that it's now time for the European Union institutions and governments to do whatever it takes to keep the area of freedom, security, and justice afloat. And that's the, the starting point of what I think should be um, a good you know, starting, starting point or like a good plan, um, which I call a European justice semester, which should combine elements of the Eurozone European semester. I know the semester is not perfect. We can talk about this in the Q&A, but I think some elements of the semester um, could be useful here and also some elements of the recovery funds. And why do I talk about the recovery fund? Because I think um, the recovery fund has fixed, at least temporarily, some of the European Union's uh, sort of macroeconomic policies shortcomings uh, because it's focused on accountability and solidarity rather than fixating on unchangeable targets and dogmatism in a way. Um, I think a European justice semester should include those features if it is to work. Now, I'm going to give you three reasons why I think the European, a European justice semester could help to rebuild trust. Um, I'm going to then outline very quickly what I think the plan should um, uh, entail, sorry. Uh, and then I will um, stop talking because I know I have been talking for uh, way too long. And we can discuss um, the nitty gritty and the procedural details uh, in the Q&A if you show so wish. The three reasons why I think a European justice semester could be helpful. The first one is because I think it would help to establish a permanent and clear link between policies related to Schengen, like the free movement of people or the sharing of police and intelligence information, which most countries like, and policies related to the wider area of freedom, security and justice, like, for example, the independence of the judiciary or common asylum and migration rules, which some countries do not like very much. The second reason is that it would help solve what I called the Copenhagen paradox, whereby democratic backsliding in some member states means that if they were to apply to join the European Union now, they would not meet the so-called Copenhagen criteria for accession. A regular overview of all just and home affairs policies, so no, not only about you know, like how the courts uh, function or not only about how Schengen functions, but all together would make it harder for countries to backslide. And third, it would also allow the European Union to better anticipate, prepare, and deal with issues of mutual trust, before they become a, a Poland-sized problem. Um, so as I said, 
I put forward a detailed seven step plan for a European justice semester in the paper. Um, maybe, you know, if, you, if you're so inclined, you can, you can uh, look at it and, and, and read it later or, 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 you know, in the coming days and, and let me know what you think about that plan. I will not repeat it here uh, because it will probably take me some half an hour. And again, I've been speaking for too long. I'm really sorry about that. But the main, the main elements of this plan, I think, um, first of all, the European Council should hold a special summit on the future of Schengen and the area of freedom, security and justice. Uh, why do I think this? I think this that because I do think that the European area of freedom, security and justice is stuck um, in the 20, you know, in the in the first decade of the 20 of the of the 21st century, when European integration was looking up and everything was was you know good in the world and Euro European countries were happy to cooperate with each other and nobody you know like thought about migration flows or or rule of law or democratic backsliding or a pandemic or whatever. And I think ever since um, the European Council used to have these summits very often, as as, as most of you know, uh, this hasn't been the case in a very long time. And we had we have had plans about the area of freedom, security, and justice, but all of them focus very, very heavily on security. Uh, and I think there is, we need to actually like break that cycle and come up with some ideas of what the European Union thinks that this area of freedom, security, and justice is um, in, the, in, this, in this time uh, of history and with current trends. And such a plan, um, I mean, the, the European Council could come up with a baseline plan which could include a monitoring mechanism based on the European semester and the, and the recovery fund. I think uh, that that plan could include some pre-agreed standards that countries um, would um, agree to abide by. Uh, these standards uh, could be drawn by the Council of Ministers and the European Commission with contributions from the Conference on the Future of Europe, which as you know, if you read my runs um, <laughs> on Twitter and elsewhere, I think should be made a, a permanent exercise. Um, this plan should be approved by the European Parliament and endorsed by the European Council. I know this is a lot of people, but it would need to be done this way to actually gather public support and leg legitimacy in a way. Now, um, I'm gonna go very quickly uh, through the rest of steps. The commission could use these standards to monitor trends, not, not only on judicial reforms, but also on how countries apply migration and asylum rules or security laws and issue some clear guidelines. The member states would need to present national plans roughly every two years, there, because this is not a budget and two years, you know, it's like, it's longer, it's a longer period. Um, it can be two year and a half, something around these lines. Um, those plans could be approved by the Council of Ministers and the Commission could then review those plans and come up with country recommendations. Um, I think along the way, EU governments and the European Commission should set up teams to ensure there's a regular communication between Brussels and European capitals and something like an early warning mechanism to spot problems before they become unmanageable, similar to the six months review device for the disbursement of the recovery fund. Now, and this, I, I'm going to finish here, um, but I think the trickiest part of this plan is what to do about countries which decide not to provide or not to um, sort of like um, comply with these standards. Um, I think we could have a warning procedure that would apply to countries which have been found to repeatedly deviate from the standards. And such a procedure could end with either a suspension of EU funds, and we can discuss in the Q&A about how this would be compatible with other mechanisms, or with a temporary freezing of the recalcitrant countries' participation in certain EU laws, like the European arrest warrants. Now, tons of details and discussions we can have about the nitty gritty of this, uh, but I will leave it for the q and I think to work a European semester cannot, justice semester, cannot be a procedural plan uh, driven solely by the European Union institutions. It would need the highest political backing and broad public support every step of the way. And I stop here. Thank you very much, Camino. Really good to have um, that overview of the paper because it's only just out and not so many people will have seen it. Um, so we're going to uh, move on to responses now and um, I'll invite my colleague, Julia Lagana, uh, to be the first respondent being an expert herself on uh, migration and also other um, freedom, security and justice um, issues. And of course, seeing the perspective from Brussels. Um, and then I'll um, open up to Q&A and just so everybody remembers the rules um, and knows how to do it on Zoom, use the raise hand function. We 
which you can see will bring up a little hand by your yourself. And then when you've finished asking your question, you can lower your hand. And when I call on you, um, the CER team will unmute you. So you don't have to do anything. I think you can just uh, uh, wait until they unmute you um, when it's time to ask your question. You're also, of course, welcome to put your question in the chat. And uh, then either uh, you can yourself uh, read it out or I can read it out for you if there's a problem with unmuting. So with all of that technical things, you can start thinking about what question you'd like to ask on Camino's bold and ambitious proposals. And I'd like to invite Julia Lagana now to give her um, her views as the first response. Over to you. Thanks a lot, Heather, and, and thanks, Camino, for, for the great presentation. Um, I'll keep my remarks very, very brief for two reasons. One is that a lot of my comments have already fed into the paper. As Heather mentioned, Camino and I have been, uh, well, Camino mainly, 95% has been drafting this paper for a long time. Um, and the second is, as Heather also mentioned, that um, yes, I have I have COVID and two small kids who also have COVID, so my brain is not functioning very well right now. <laughs> um, so I will not bore you unnecessarily. Um, just a couple of quick remarks, picking up on some of the things that, that um, the previous speakers have said. Um, the first is that I think it's it's striking that the, the area of freedom, security and justice is older than the Eurozone, because um, it was launched with the Tampere Summit in 99, um, and it has more members in the Eurozone um, in terms of Schengen and so on. Um, but it does seem to be continuously brought up as being in crisis, and it hasn't been resolved, unlike the Eurozone. Um, and maybe that's because, as, as one of the participants in uh, this meeting um, illustrated very um, eloquently in a fantastic paper which came out, I think, three years ago, it was before the pandemic, so again, time has kind of slipped, um, Raoul Weberekin, who is also here uh, today, he wrote this great paper on Schengen. Um, in which uh, I think the basic gist was that despite the fact that we continuously refer to the crisis that Schengen um, is undergoing, Schengen is incredibly resilient and has proven to work time and time again. And, and the pandemic has shown that it also um, quite remarkably. Um, what, what, doesn't, um, what is striking given that Schengen does work and which as, as Liz um, highlighted, has also been a recurrent theme over the last years is that despite Schengen working, the hysteria over you know, control of, of Schengen's external borders hasn't abated because it has been polarized and politicized as, as both Camino and Heather um, pointed out. Um, maybe just a couple of points, as I said, picking up on some of the things which, which have been said. Um, my, my area of specialization is migration as well, so I'll refer to that um, um, primarily. Um, as, as, as others have said, there is a broad consensus um, that, that the area of freedom, security, and justice has to be fixed. Um, and migration, I think, sets a series of precedents, which I think um, are quite important. Um, one, um, before, I, before I go into them, a caveat, which is that we usually refer to migration as kind of this, this issue which is used as a battering ram to drive fissures between uh, member states and sort of divide the EU into blocks. And I would argue, as I think Liz did um, implicitly, that unfortunately there is a broad consensus around migration right now, which is um, around mainly trying to keep irregular migrants out, uh, restrict access to asylum, and unfortunately um, roll out a series of practices which violate human rights at the EU's external borders, rather than focusing on a more sustainable model of migration management. And perhaps Camino's proposals in terms of the European semester could take some of that political bite out of the debate and focus again on the basics, which are the, the key on asylum, for instance, which is still there and should be implemented um, and should be monitored and, as Liz said, um, enforced by the EU institutions who sometimes are staying rather silent. Um, I also agree with the point made by Camilla that all um, justice and home affairs crises are, are, are very interrelated. And, uh, and I just cite two examples of that. Um, one is the fact that despite security being far less controversial than other areas of justice and home affairs, it is true that a lot of the consensus around anti-terrorism um, does have nuances of strong Islamophobia, and that's a growing problem across the EU, which I think we should all take into account. Um, and the second is the fact that um, migration and, and the precedents that are set by migration um, have, have led to the spiraling of, of rule of law crises in a number of member states. And, you know, as the, the apocryphal Bertolt Brecht uh, quote goes, first they came for the migrants um, and then for the migrants' rights NGOs. 
Um, and then in a lot of member states, unfortunately for the media and independent journalism and moved on to the judiciary. So I've seen, I think we've seen that pattern in a number of member states, not just in the usual suspects, but also in Western Europe. Um, and I think something which would sort of, again, detoxify that debate could help to um, allay uh, those trends. Um, I think finally that the, the semester idea um, and the idea of carrots and sticks and a uniform kind of procedure for all member states, much like the semester for, for, that was implemented by the Stability and Growth Pact, despite the fact that it, that also was heavily politicized in a number of especially southern debtor countries um, by um, elements of the far right. Um, can help to allay concerns both in Northern Europe about you know, the allegedly freeloading um, lax Southerners, um, but also in Southern Europe about the fact that hi the hypocritical Northerners are bashing us and you know, forcing us to respect these rules that they themselves are not respecting. Um, and again, to give one example on migration, um, the, the off-site and secondary movements which Northern European member states um, have been trying to, to, to fight for, for many years in terms of asylum seekers moving from uh, frontline countries in, in Southern Europe towards the North. Well, we're now seeing Denmark, for instance, which has implemented um, very restrictive asylum policies, effectively stripping Syrian refugees of protection. And what we're seeing now is a ripple effect whereby Syrian refugees are now moving to Denmark, to Sweden and Germany and other EU states. Um, to make sure that they are not um, deported to um, Damascus. Um, so if there was less pink finger pointing and more trust, I think that would lead to, to two key outcomes, which I think are important in terms of what Camino said, which is keeping the European project together. Um, and one is the instrumentalization or weaponization of trust, because again, um, as Camino hinted, sometimes the lack of trust is, 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 is a question of bad faith rather than an actual fact. And the second is something that um, Liz alluded, alluded to, which is the fact that if the EU wants to be credible on the global stage, it has to ensure that it does respect the basic values that it purports to stand up for. Um, and so if it does respect the rule of law, if it does respect asylum, if it does respect human rights more broadly, um, and the independence of the judiciary and of the media, then I think that makes it a more credible actor when it has to confront, for instance, Lukashenko, um, and also, for instance, now Putin and his antics um, in the Donbass. Um, so those, those would be my final remarks, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what everybody else has to say, and I've gone on far too long, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Julia. So now uh, we've got about half an hour um, for q and I actually um, am realizing that the CER's uh, plan, which was to use raise hand function, is actually tricky because I actually can't see the hands um, in front of people's faces. Um, I, I can't see anybody except the speaker. I think you're in a similar situation. Everybody else is. So I'm waiting to um, get the uh, those the names from the CER um, on, but I can see them in the attendee list. So I'm very glad that Raphael Bosson um, has a question. Raphael, over to you. Um, CR, can you please unmute, unmute Raphael to ask his question? Okay. Hello. Uh, thank you. Thank you also for this uh, paper and the long work of the group, which is indeed very interesting. Uh, just as a to claim a high, I'm, I'm working on the justice and home affairs issues in the German Institute for International Security Affairs in Berlin. Um, so uh, first, however, while I actually do like the very long and sort of strategic view on the policy area, and I think it's very much necessary to talk about that beyond just, you know, the latest crisis, the latest excitement, um, I, I have fundamentally one first criticism or critical remark. Um, let's put aside the question whether it's realistic or not to get the member states to sign up to such an ambitious uh, proposal. Um, my main question is though, what makes you believe that the European Council on, of all actors would be the place where there'll be any chance at all to have a, say constructive and critical discussion about rule of law and making member states abide by that? I mean, we have this debate about article seven for heaven's sake, we don't even manage article seven paragraph one where, where there isn't unanimity. And even that is too sensitive so far, and nobody is picking up that mantle. So, um, you know, I could make it even more provocative and say, if we were to give the European Council that mandate and not just ask them to actually fill up 
that Article 7 or say the strategic guidelines under Article 68 TFEU where they should have some general policy ideas about the ASFJ, which is another matter. You know, if we were to sort of sort of make the European Council this ultimate arbiter of say the rule of law and the judiciary and actual balance uh, area of freedom, security and justice, then it is in all likelihood very security centered. You know, this is what I will, I'll stop. I'll stop. This is, yeah. you know, what we heard from the European Council over the last years. It's all about security union. It's all about border security. And there is hardly anything else. So, yes. That's, thank you, Raphael. It's okay. I think, I think, we, 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 for the, for the I think we've got it. And yeah, thank you. No, it's very clear your, your question. Um, really super. Um, now, a related and very complimentary question, I think, from Carl Dolan, who's put it in the chat. Carl, would you like to um, to speak now? Uh, we can see your question in the chat, but it'd be great to hear your voice as well. Possibly he can't join us. No, he's having a microphone problem. Okay, so let me just uh, read it out to everybody. So uh, Carl says, very interesting paper. Um, Carl is, by the way, Deputy Director of the Open Society European Policy Institute. He asks, why do we consider the European semester as the model to emulate, since many would contest that it has achieved its broader aim, can I think he means has not achieved its broader aim, which is convergence of macroeconomic policies or its more specific aims, i.e. there has been a low level of compliance with the semester recommendations. So that relates actually very much back to Raphael's point about which institution would do the enforcement and to what Julia was just saying about the problems with implementation of an enforcement, even where there is a clear acquis, uh, for example, in asylum. Um, so um, would you like to come back on this at uh, this point now, um, uh, Camino? We also are. Uh, we also have a question from Matthias Rudger. I'd quite like to do them in threes, so I'm going to add this third question and then invite Camino to come back. I won't ask you to come back on absolutely everything, Camino, but these are very useful uh, direct questions about how you foresee um, the what I might call the Montero plan working. Um, so uh, the tr the, we have also the trust question from Matthias. Matthias, would you like to ask it yourself? You're just going to be unmuted. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Great. Okay, thank you very much. And, and thank you very much, uh, Camino, for reminding us that in reality, the whole area of justice and home affairs is uh, basically the blueprint was in, in the Schengen implement, implementing uh, convention of, uh, of 1990. And that was uh, then copied into the Maastricht Treaty and, uh, and all the rest. Uh, and we have to a certain extent uh, dissociated a lot of different areas which really belong together. However, I'm very skeptical that with the European Council working on the basis of consensus that we can get uh, very far on that. My experience in a lot of other areas has been that uh, trust has been built up between member states through working concretely together on certain issues. And we have a number of very interesting agencies. If you take uh, Frontex, if you take uh, Europol, uh, if you take Eurojust, if you take the asylum, the new asylum agency, should we not to a certain extent taking up the, the point uh, of Antonio Vitorino with the small steps, uh, rather work uh, in terms of building trust and consensus on a lot of issues in these agencies? Is that not a better way? Thank you. Thank you very much. And just so everybody knows, Matthias Rutter, who just spoke, was uh, uh, outgoing director general, in fact, of DG Home and uh, was the architect of a lot of the response during the 2015 to 16 migration crisis and has worked on these issues, worked on these issues for, I think, about three decades um, in the commission. So we've got three questions which are actually quite related to the council. Um, how to get the European Council to act and work, but also uh, the Council of Ministers uh, one level down. Um, and in particular, how essentially this is really a lot about the way in which um, the EU institutions bring member states together and getting the member states to follow through on what they've agreed to um, in the Council. Um, so a question from Matthias about uh, use of agencies, a question from Carl about um, the failings, in fact, of the European semester system, even on the economic side. Um, and of course, um, the, the question from Raphael about um, the, the way in which the, the Council might deal with this in future. So Camino, would you like to, to come in first on those? And everybody else, um, especially so because so many of you today have fantastic experience um, at the, the coal face, really at the sharp end 
of these policies. Feel free to give your own views on how you think this might work and, and how Camino's uh, system might function. Are there aspects of it that you think will be, could in fact function well? It's always easy with a bold proposal like this um, to point out all of the flaws and uh, the European Union is itself full of flaws, but there are also promising ideas there and it would be great to have some engagement uh, with what you think might work as well as what might not work. But Camino, over to you um, for initial responses to those three questions. Thanks so much, Heather, again. And I feel like, you know, when I was like sort of like presenting my thesis and faced with all these questions that I studied like over and over um, again, I um, understand the points and I've been through these points myself a lot. So just to clarify uh, on Raphael's question, I am not suggesting by any means that the European Council should be the driving institution uh, behind this exercise. What I think is that we need to have a um, sort of common understanding uh, of what the European Union means when it talks about an area of freedom, security and justice, and when it talks about Schengen. And the reason why I start off by uh, bringing the European Council into this, and I think the European Council should have a special summits, and that's not something that you know would be a new uh, thing since, as I said before, and you know it um, as well very well. Um, Rafael and 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 the rest of the, of the people having worked on this area for a long time, this used to be the case. Um, again, like when things were looking up, there were um, programs, a temporary program. Uh, and, and, and others, um, and there were like guidelines and, and there was a constant discussion on what the European Union wanted to do about the area of freedom, security and justice and how to make it happen. Now, this discussion stopped because member states started to get a bit, you know, um, wary of, of the amount of details that uh, were going into these programs, were going into these plans and the amount of things that they were required to do and the involvement of uh, the commission and later the European Parliament. And I think that there's, it's naive to think that we can have any sort of agreement on, you know, what kind of European Union we want to have without having a frank discussion amongst EU governments. Whether we like the current incumbents of some EU governments or we don't, they are part of the club and we have to listen to what they have to say. And so my point on that um, first um, step of the plan. And I know, once again, I know that this is a very ambitious proposal. I do not claim uh, to, you know, to have this magical solution that you're going to implement tomorrow and this can happen. This is a very difficult, um, uh, again, like very daring um, idea that, um, you know, you could take um, incrementally as well. Uh, but I think one of the things that is actually really possible is to have a discussion uh, within the European Council is to have a discussion amongst uh, governments and to decide what is that we want to do. I, I honestly think that you know, um, we have nothing to lose in, given the situation that we're in at the moment, especially with the rule of law. We have nothing to lose to actually open up a, a discussion about which kind of community of values we want to be and who wants to be part of it and who doesn't want to be part of it and how can we actually make it so that we are all on the same page and not and we are not in 1999 when you know the circumstances and the situation was completely different so that's why i bring the european council into the mix at the beginning of the process that's why i also think that there should be a, a sort of an endorsement of um, some baseline plans, I call it, um, some idea, some discussion, something on an acknowledging that the European area of freedom, security and justice needs an update and, and especially acknowledging the link in between the area of freedom, security and justice and Schengen, which I think as Matthias, as Matthias said himself uh, very well, and he knows it better than me, um, we sort of like forgot uh, that this was the case, and that's something that Raúl has also brought up in this in, in his really excellent paper. So I think that's what the European Council could um, be. And by the way, let's not forget, and I know that we might not be all fans of uh, the European Council presidents, but there is such a thing as a European Council president whose task is actually to broker consensus amongst member states. So it's not only about uh, EU governments, but it's also about EU, the EU institution called the European Council and the European Council president. president. 
now called about the European semester. I know this is a, a theme that we've gone over and over again with members of the group and, and Julia and, 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 and my colleagues at the CR as well. The European semester is not perfect. And that's something that we, I um, sort of like go into detail in the paper itself. Um, I don't claim that the European semester has like solved the, U the Eurozone problems at all. Um, I know that it has a lot of um, shortcomings uh, and that's the reason why I bring into the equation the recovery fund, because I do think that the way the recovery fund works and the way that is structured to have a six month review, a performance based um, disbursement of funds, uh, looking at things like the rule of law, looking at indicators and things like that, I think is a much is a much better way to do things than, you know, the way that we have done things up to now. The problem is that the recovery fund at the moment is supposed to be a temporary system. So if you need to like sort of get inspiration uh, on, on some sort of review mechanism, um, you, I think you can take some ideas from the European semester. So this idea of having um, sort of a, a, a monitoring trends uh, and, and, and coming, you know, having a dialogue and all these things, but especially you have to bring this new um, more accountable uh, slash um, performance-based um, sort of uh, principles from um, the recovery funds uh, into the equation. So if you ask me, I would have loved to call this thing um, the, a, sort of a European justice recovery funds of some sorts, um, but I'm a little bit wary and that's why I've been really careful in trying to make this thing as realistic as possible, taking into account the current political situation, I'm I'm wary that the recovery fund uh, will actually gain gain some traction and 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 sort of like be established as a, as a permanent um, thing. So and that's why I I, I talk about it a semester, even though I myself hate um, that that specific words. Um, now, Matthias, when it comes to the agencies, I agree with you and like. There is a lot, and that's that, that's the reason why this whole uh, conversation started in 2014, anyway, um, because uh, the, the area of human security and justice, JHA, whatever, it, it's all being a question of small incremental steps and a question of like sort of like breaking of the silos and people working on migration, talking to people working on fundamental rights and things like that. And the agencies have done an amazing job uh, to 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 improve that, and are still doing an amazing job. Um, about that. I particularly think Europol um, has a very important role to play um, in, this, in, this, um, in this area since it's a really valued tool of cooperation, not only amongst member states, but also for third countries. Um, so it could include it could also like help the European Union become a little bit more powerful in the, in the international scene. But that's an, another discussion. So I think the agencies are a very good place where to sort of like try and and you know bring people together, understand each other, understand the systems, all that. Um, but at the same time, I have the feeling, and this might only be my feeling, uh, but I've been working in this area for like a long time as well, and I have the feeling that we 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 keep on coming back to that idea of like sharing of best practice and like you know talking to each other and um, having forums, multilateral, whatever, and we keep ignoring like we keep sidestepping side, side the big issues and, and sidestepping the big conversations. And I think, whereas there is some merits on this idea of small steps, I think, and that's what I say in the paper, that's not a sustainable strategy anymore because we are, the, we are at the point where not even the small steps are actually helping in like solving some of the very entrenched problems that we have and the dividing lines that we have in between some member states and other member states. So indeed, Small, small steps agencies, all the technical stuff is great and it's, it's going to continue to happen, but we need to have a broader, more political, so, sort of more daring conversation, which is the reason why I sort of insist on having a political um, background to this whole European semester idea. Super, thank you very much, Camino. So that everybody knows, we've got about another 10, 12 minutes uh, to run. So ask your question now or hold your peace. Um, we've got two very good um, people who know this area well uh, to ask questions and I'll add something of my own. So Raul Uberekin, would you like to come in? Another godfather of the era of freedom, security and justice. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Heather. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I deserve that that title, though. Uh, there have been many, many, many before me there, just trying to uh, to uh, 
continue keeping keeping it alive. Um, no, thanks very much to to Camino, uh, Julia, and others uh, for for this uh, very bold attempt uh, at putting back at the heart of. Uh, what I now start calling the Schengen area of freedom, security and justice, um, the, the element that is actually at the heart of, of the European project in its entirety, which is the element of trust. Um, but trust, I think, is only one of the indispensable uh, ingredients that are at the heart of uh, the project from the start. The other one um, is self-interest. Now, this might sound a bit uh, transactional, but um, if not every member of the club sees a benefit in what we're building, then we do have an issue. Um, I mean, if you look across the board at whatever the European Union has, has worked on, uh, even on issues like structural funds, the internal market, the Eurozone, and especially the way we have solved each and every crisis that came our way. And, and you very rightly draw the parallel with, with, with the Eurozone uh, crisis. Um, it is self-interest in the end that makes everybody come to the table. So I think whatever we build in, in, in the future uh, for the Schengen area of freedom, security and justice, we need to make sure, um, be it as commission with their proposals, be it as uh, council, be it as the president of the European Council, that everybody uh, in the club sees sees a benefit in it, uh, and everybody sees an interest in joining, in chipping in. Um, I think this has been one of the main flaws uh, or main reasons why uh, we're still not there with the migration reform, uh, because there is a fundamental flaw in the proposals. And it, it also explains why um, security is, is such a con consensual topic. Uh, why uh, Europol is, is such an amazing success story, because everybody uh, benefits from it. Everybody sees, uh, sees his, his interests um, coming, coming, coming together. So, on. so uh, an additional appeal, I would say, from, from, from my side here, uh, besides the congratulations for, for the paper and, uh, and the very, very uh, good and, and bold ideas you put on the table, uh, table, is that we don't forget this other essential element, which is actually making sure that each and everybody sees an interest in joining. Thank you, Raoul. Um, now I'd like to ask Lord Hannay to come in. Can you hear us, David? Just Fantastic. need to see. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, I had been going to uh, abstain from speaking, uh, uh, being a citizen of a third country, but um, I did want to ask a couple of questions which are a little bit outside uh, Camino's paper, but not outside Camino's experience, which was extremely uh, profound in this matter. Um, firstly, uh, could the, anybody on the panel give a judgment as to how successful the arrangements made on security were when uh, the trade and cooperation agreement was agreed and how they're working, whether they could be improved? Because, of course, the European area that we're talking about doesn't exist in a vacuum uh, and um, it exists alongside uh, this awkward country, which is only 30 miles away. And secondly, on migration, uh, is, is the European Union just to sit back and leave the not very successful efforts by the British government and the French government to deal with migration problems across the channel to be sorted out by them alone? Or is there a role for the European Union in that matter? Thank you very much, um, David. I note the exceptionally large number of uh, British participants today, which I think is not just because of the CER, but because Britain was always, as a member state, actually quite keen on a lot of the AFSJ cooperation. And it was Germany that was much more cautious about it, and, and France sometimes quite suspicious too. Um, so, and uh, which I think is also why there were so many um, really excellent British officials who have pushed it forward at different times. But let's not dwell on this, on this rather sad and sore point. Um, I just wanted to 
add, Camino, um, uh, a, a brief um, question of my own about this, because this question of the European semester is, of course, thorny because it hasn't worked brilliantly, but um, it has evolved a lot in the past few years. And in particular, the country specific recommendations have become more and more specific. Um, and the Commission has become bolder about putting things in there related to the rule of law. And I wonder if um, actually broadening the existing instruments of the um, of the European semester might be an easier way forward rather than creating a new system. New systems are notoriously difficult to, uh, to get going at EU level. And as Raoul was just pointing out, all of the member states would have to see an interest in doing that. So very hard to get agreement in the council, especially at the moment. Um, but the idea of using the country specific recommendations to cover um, these, this broader question of AFSJ. And of course, also what the commission has put in place now with the annual rule of law report, um, those could be, I wonder if you, you think those would be more promising routes. Um, also because of course, uh, that there is a very clear mandate to the commission to work in those areas, which makes the commission sometimes less silent than on certain other areas where it wishes to avoid uh, political controversy, unfortunately, as Julia was pointing out earlier. So uh, I'm curious to know what you think about those sorts of um, quite sort of down in the weeds questions, but important ones, because um, right now um, it's it's always it, you know, it's, it's law often been said that the EU moves forward um, because of crises and that it takes a good crisis crisis to kind of push forward integration and that's when things happen. The crisis is also a moment that sometimes divides member states and makes it harder to get a common system. So adding bells and whistles to do with AFSJ to the existing European semester system might uh, might work a bit better. So very glad to know what you what you think about this. And I see that um, Andrew Duff has also put in a, a very pertinent question. Did you consider the viability of using enhanced cooperation provisions to revive FSJ? And that's another very good point regarding the way the council works, should we be thinking about either enhanced cooperation or indeed more QMV? So I'm um, very glad to, to know what you think about that, Camina. God, and I have four minutes uh, to go over all this, um, which is sort of like, you know, like I've been, I've been working on this for seven years <laughs> and I have so, so much to say about this, but I'm gonna be really quick. Um, Raul, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, and that's, I myself am very cynical in this. I think that if we want to have working proposals, we need to work with what we have. And what we have are governments, um, which um, you know drive integration and governments have voters and voters ideas have changed very much since the European Union was first founded and we had the Euro or we have the area of the security and justice. So there has to be an element of what's in it for me. And that's why I refer in the paper um, to the common borderless legal area. And that's what I pointed out in my, in my introduction and also in the paper um, several times that the most, um, the most um, pressing or the most important um, consequence of having no trust is actually uh, the possibility of having countries uh, being kicked out of this common less, um, sorry, borderless common legal area. Being kicked out de facto, being kicked out, um, you know, the euro, because there are some proposals on the table to actually do this um, in practice. And this, if you want to sell it uh, to governments, you can very well say, right, I mean, we might not be, you know, we might not see eye to eye when it comes to values. And I understand the, the argument of some government saying, I didn't sign up for sort of like same sex marriages or whatever, that's illiberal, but it's not wrong. This was not what, you know, like the European Union was about at the beginning or even in 2004, uh, but the European Union and society has evolved and, you know, like institutions have to evolve, have to evolve um, with them. So to me, the argument is not about like, you know, we all have to think the same about certain topics, even though I am absolutely horrified by what Poland is doing about abortion rights and all these kind of things. I think the argument is, you know, if you don't abide by the rules, it's a club, um, it's a common less border, a borderless common legal area, sorry, where you actually benefit a lot uh, also from the single market and from movement of people, education and all these kind of things, then you might as well just not participate in it. And that's going to be bad, not only, um, you know, for your image or whatever, but it's also going to be bad for your citizens, it's also going to be bad for your company. So that's why I think this element of like being very clear about the fact that this is not about 
the rule of law migration or whatever. It's actually about the fact that we have a, a, a common community uh, of legal you know, mechanisms and legal things that are enabling people and businesses and, 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 and things to happen. Um, that's that's the, the reason why I think you would, would get some um, governments, you know, like moving more quickly than if you, you go around talking about values and, and European integration and things like that. Um, when it comes to um, the, um, sorry, the TCA, maybe I will leave it for another um, webinar, um, if that's okay, because that's, that's a whole Brexit um, angle uh, to the thing which I'm, I'm not necessarily prepared to think about at the moment. Um, when it comes about um, what you, Heather, um, suggests about the European semester and the country-specific recommendations, one thing that the European semester works very well with is actually the way it fits into some of the policy uh, decisions that the European Commission does take with these country recommendations. I know that lots of people think that you know country recommendations do not get enough traction and they, they are not enough followed or whatever, but they sort of like force countries as well to come um, up with some, um, you know, like uh, quantifiable indicators on a number of things. And those include um, um, civil justice, childcare stuff, I can, like the country specific recommendation already cover JHA things like corruption and things like that. Um, the reason why I don't think that a, you know, a, a sort of like a boosted or a, or a, a European semester JHA plus whatever um, is necessarily um, the thing I'm going for is because with the idea of a European justice semester, uh, I think the main point I'm trying to make is that we have to have a plan that actually links every single element of this area of freedom, security, and justice together. So it's not only about corruption, it's not only about the rule of law, it's not only about civil uh, justice or whatever, it's about everything. And it actually like really makes it very clear that the reason why we have this in the first place is because we don't have borders and that, you know, sort of like brings rights and obligations. And if you do that through sort of like putting some new chapters in the European semester recommendations, you lose that political uh, momentum and you lose that message, which I think is very important if we want to make this whole thing um, work in the in the in the long term. And high school cooperation, absolutely. Um, that's something that I also um, uh, talk about in the paper, which is the fact that I am aware of the fact that these are very difficult questions, um, very difficult discussions to be had. And then obviously, um, if you know we were to actually move on with this we might need to consider um, at some point to, um, to move forward with a certain number of countries. And um, I, Andrew, we, we can talk offline as well because there's a lot of procedures and I know that you like these things uh, and so do I. Uh, there's a lot of specifics in the paper on how this could work, um, basically trying to have a two um, stage sort of like um, process and having uh, qualified majority voting um, at some stage and reverse qualified majority voting at, at, at another stage. But I do think, I mean, I have thought about this and I, I do think that obviously if this proposal came to, to life, ideally it would be uh, done by consensus uh, as the European Council likes to do things or used to do things or does things. Uh, but there is a chance that this could not happen and then high cooperation uh, could and should be considered. Now, I think uh, I should leave one minute, if Charles is okay with that, to Julia to respond on the migration question, because I'm realizing that I'm taking way too much time and she's... Uh, go go ahead, one minute, and then we'll turn over to Charles. Go ahead, Camina. Just a quick one on that. No, sorry, I just, I just, I just said I would like to give that minute, that final minute to Julia to reply to that question. I, Julia, you're welcome to, but I think she doesn't want to come in again. Uh, yeah, it's a complicated I've evening. I've got some background everybody. sound noise issues right now. I'm sorry. <laughs> no problem. Then, then I, I think we can perhaps, you know, organize uh, another webinar to talk about the TCA and then another webinar to talk about the question of migration where we can have Julia, hopefully, you know, in the flesh and hopefully without kids uh, crying around uh, to, res to respond to this question. 
Okay, we'll have to leave that one open for now because we need to turn over to Charles before we close. And I'm so sorry that we can't invite everybody for a drink and an informal discussion as we've often done before at these meetings. Um, so many of the best conversations happened in fact after the seminar. So it's, it's a real pity of losing that in these COVID times. But I hope that um, the people who've asked such good questions today and those whom I know have views on this subject uh, will join in future um, seminars on this subject. The CER certainly will be continuing to work on it. Um, so Charles, over to you on what the CER will be doing. Thank you very much, Heather. Um, well, for the last seven years, my role in the Amato group has been to represent people who don't understand anything about JHA. And that's why I find it so useful to have this group. Indeed, uh, it was Hugo Brady's idea, who Hugo preceded Camino at the Centre for European Reform. Hugo had the idea and I said, what a great idea that then I can learn a bit about JHA from this group. Um, Camille may have forgotten, but when she applied for the job at the CR, working at the CR as our JHA fellow, I said, the condition for you coming, Camille, is you have to then make the Amato group, which Hugo has already dreamed up, a reality and put it into practice. And luckily, she agreed to met, meet that condition. So the result is she came to the CR and we have the Amato group. And I would say that although we're, we're now winding it up, it, it doesn't mean the CR is not going to go on doing work on JHA. We can do lots of work on JHA and the area of freedom and security of justice, and indeed Britain's relationship with it, as Lord Hannay has indicated we should. So that, that's certainly, uh, that's assumed. Um, now, um, when, when, when I first went to Brussels as a journalist in 1989, JHA was so irrelevant that there wasn't even a Directorate General for it. There was a unit in the Secretariat General run by a wonderful man called Adrian Fortescue, who sadly is no longer with us. It was a small part of the Secretariat General, and there was no commissioner for JHA. And now, you know, 20, 30, 33, uh, 32 years later, we have this is about th roughly three commissioners and several directorates general, depending how you count them, all working on JHA. And that's because it's become, it's moved from being a technical subject to a political subject, which, which I think is, is very all good and proper. And I like the way Camino frames the development of JHA in comparison with the development of the Eurozone. But the difference, of course, as she points out, is the Eurozone, having faced huge crises in the last 20 years has sort of come through them with new institutions like the European Stability Mechanism, the Recovery Fund and others which have helped it to overcome its crises, while the comparable integration in the JHA area hasn't really come, come about properly yet, in certain areas it has, but not, not fully yet. And the Migration Compact, which was mentioned, has not done terribly well so far. And I think partly that's because it's just so jolly complicated, this, the subject, and partly because it's as Raoul indicated, you're not going to get integration unless everybody sees the benefits from it. And that hasn't yet happened. Um, I mean, one thing that's quite new to me in the last few years is seeing the connection between justice and home affairs and the rule of law issues. And I like the fact that Camino's new paper focuses so much on the rule of law, which she herself has written a lot on, together with our former colleague, Agatha Gostinska. But I'm, on that, I'm fairly optimistic. I do think, and it's beyond the scope of the seminar, I do think the Commission is getting exact together. And I don't think in the long run, countries that abuse the rule of law will get a whole lot of money out of EU funds. I think the Commission's getting quite tough on them. We'll see what happens. But, um, but really, the, the, the broader point about JHA becoming political is it becomes very divisive. Uh, and I think that's, that shouldn't, it's not necessarily a bad thing. If, if, if things are political, they are divisive. And voters get concerned, and voters get interested, and politicians get concerned. That's why I think, although Julia, I think, wasn't a great fan of bringing the European Council in to rule on all these issues, you know, if something's very political, you can't keep the European Council out of it. And I think you can't, and although Julia rightly says you shouldn't only focus on security at the expense of human rights, you have to do both of them. And if elected politicians think their voters worry about security, you have to meet their concerns on security, but all while, while certainly standing up for the rights of migrants and others. So I think the art is to find a kind of marriage between security and human rights. And that's what has to happen to some degree in the European Council. In the long run, because it's such a divisive issue, JHA, I do think not everybody's going to do everything together. And as some of you know, I've long been a, somebody who's thought that President Macron's vision of a Europe of concentric circles, which he occasionally comes back to, is probably where we, with ease going in the long run. I think that's fine, so long as the inner circles remain open to members of the outer circles and don't shut the drawbridge after they've got inside the inner circle. That's absolutely fine. I can't see myself see the Schengen area existing in its current form forever unless every member of it shows more willingness to accept solidarity in dealing with, with migrants and asylum seekers and so on than they show today. So I think, I think a certain amount of, of, of uh, variable geometry is probably inevitable. 
Um, and just finally, I did, to, to come back to what Raul said, I do think his point about progress requires everybody to see the benefit and self-interest is absolutely right. That is why the Commission's current proposals on migration perhaps have not got very far. Um, and I do think that just to, to, to end where I started, I think although we, we were not here to talk about the British role in the EU or this relationship with the EU, I think in the long run, you can't consider the area of freedom, security and justice without considering how you improve Britain's relationship with that area. And the current arrangements are not at all optimal and the CR will certainly come up with ideas on how to make them less bad than they would otherwise be, which is what, what we're about now. Thanks, thanks very much to everybody for making this seminar a great success. Thanks to all the women involved, almost no men involved, but thank was up apart from Juliana, but thanks to all the women who made it happen, Camino, Heather, Ju Julia, and, and others. And thanks to all the participants who've been taking part in one of these wonderful meetings for the last seven years. And I hope we'll see many more of you in the future in real seminars with a drink afterwards. Thanks very much and cheerio everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you all very much for your excellent questions.